Hello, everyone. I'm John Greco, founder and chair of the Marketing Impact Council. And welcome to the first in a series of council webinars addressing marketing and communications in a COVID-19 impacted world. This inaugural session titled the COVID-19 Reset, a value-based strategic path forward, has been organized and produced by the council in close collaboration with our strategic partner communications match whose founder and CEO, Simon Erskine-Lock, will be co-moderating with me today. Uh, Simon and I would like to recognize and thank our supporting partners, including Compro Biz, led by Faye Shapiro, the fin Financial Communication Society, led by Kevin Windorf, and, and particularly want to thank and welcome the many members of that organization who have joined us here today, and Capital Communicator, led by Paul Dunning. We very, very much appreciate all of their support in bringing this to you. Now, our panelists today are Noel Capon, Amy Edmondson, and Jeffrey Henning. Noel Capon is the R.C. Koch Professor of International Marketing at Columbia University Business School, where he previously served as chair of the marketing division. He's taught and chaired at some of the most prominent institutions in the world and has consulted with leading brands all around the globe. His work spans the areas of marketing, planning, and strategy, as well as key strategic account management. His latest book is called The Frontline Sales Manager, Field General. Now, he's a member of the Marketing Impact Council Advisory Board and a board member of the Strategic Account, Ma strategic account Management Association, SAMA. Noel is also chairman and founder of West Express Publishing. Amy Edmondson, is a Novartis Professor of Leadership and Management at the Harvard Business School, a chair established to support the study of human interactions that lead to the creation of successful enterprises that contribute to the betterment of society. She has been regularly recognized by the biannual Thinkers 50 Global Ranking of Management Thinkers since 2011. Her focus is on teaming, psychological safety, and organizational learning. Amy's most recent book is The Fearless Organization, Creating Psychological Safety in the Workplace for Learning, Innovation, and Growth. Before her academic career, she was Director of Research at Pecos River Learning Center, where she and I first met, and where she worked on transformational change in large companies. In the early 1980s, she also worked as Chief Engineer for the world-renowned architect and inventor, Bucky Fuller. <laughs> Jeffrey Henning, is founder and chief research officer of ResearchScape. He is a professionally certified researcher and has per personally conducted over a thousand survey research projects. He's currently the volunteer president of the Market Research Institute International, a member of the Insights Association and the American Association of Public Opinion Researchers. In 2012, he was the inaugural winner of the MRA's Impact Award. Before founding ResearchScape in 2012, Jeffrey co-founded Perseus Development Corporation in 1993, which introduced the first web-based survey software, and Vovici in 2006, which pioneered the enterprise feedback management category. A 30-year veteran of the research industry, he began his career as an industry analyst for Giga Information Group, now part of Forrester. Now, our discussion today will be about the need for businesses and nonprofits to reevaluate, adapt, and reposition their value propositions and reset strategy and messaging for a new world. The importance of research and engaging with all stakeholders to understand how to create the greatest value for them and why leaders need to have the courage to embrace uncertainty and unite their teams in order to, to succeed. The COVID-19 reset is an opportunity for leaders and their teams both internal and external teams, to engage at all levels to directly connect strategy, marketing, and communications, and to maximize value. Now, all of this is very consistent with the core pillars and the evolving value proposition that the council offers to its members. You can learn more about the council, its benefits and membership options on our website at mktgimpactcouncil.com or by directly reaching out to me. You can find out more about our partner Communications Match, a powerful agency and consultant search and hiring platform 
at communicationsmatch.com. So now let me turn to the panel. Amy, I'd like to start with you because it appears to me that we all need to begin by addressing the fact that in order for the required reset and the integrations of strategy, marketing, and communications to have any chance of success, we all need to create the right organizational environment to enable change and adaptation, creating that psychological safety and encouraging teaming. Now, that was challenging enough a few months ago when we were experiencing whatever our normal amount of regular external change and stimuli was. As you look at this all through the lens of the Fearless Organization and all of your work, how do you think we might accelerate the process in order to address this extraordinary set of changes that we're faced with and the need to do a reset that we're all dealing with today in, in light of COVID-19? John, thank you, and thanks for having me on this on this panel. It's it's really a great honor, and I think that's a terrific question. I like the word accelerate. Um, now, here's I, mean, I need to back up for a moment because a lot of people have been asking me, "Wow, you know, you study psychological safety, and clearly this is now a time of great fear, right? A time of of, of global a global degree of fear, and that is true." Um, and, and there's an assumption that these two things are sort of um, at odds when, when in fact, I think it's, it's bimodal. And, and by that, I mean um, for many, and I think for well-run organizations, this situation is bringing people together, right? So it's, it's um, and, and it's probably helpful to make a, just a quick distinction between psychological safety or a lack of psychological safety at work, which is subtle, um, and by that, I mean invisible. If someone holds back because they feel afraid to speak up with an, a tentative idea or a concern or a mistake or a harebrained idea, um, that moment of holding back is invisible to the rest of us. Right? So we, we don't know it occurred. So it's subtle, it's hidden. Um, it's, a, it's, it's ultimately self-protective, so it's lonely uh, in, in that way. Um, and of course, it inhibits innovation and learning and problem solving. Whereas COVID-related fear is quite shared, quite explicit, and, um, and, and leads people to, you know, to focus on the situation almost outside themselves. And, in, and at least theoretically allows and promotes problem solving. Now, that said, I, I said it was bimodal, um, because even though I think this is an invitation for everybody to jump in, roll up their sleeves and team up effectively, fearlessly, um, the reality is that many people are feeling less psychologically safe than ever. Um, and, and many are, are the opposite. Now, those who are feeling less psychologically safe are those who, are, who find themselves um, unable to speak up openly, maybe about what's going on at home that's making it hard for them to work from home, or maybe about unsafe uh, warehouse conditions or frontline caregivers who are worried and upset, understandably, about an inadequate supply of personal protective equipment, right? And so, um, and of course, we've seen headline stories whereby, say, nurses have spoken up and, and been punished for doing so, which of course is, does the exact opposite to psychological safety. Uh, than, than we would like uh, to see. Um, so what that means is, uh, it's bimodal. Um, we need to celebrate and drive forward those places where people are open and problem solving and teaming effectively and really double down on trying to create the kind of environment for your own sake and others where people feel that their voice is welcome. You know, good, bad, and ugly. The, the, this is a time for great candor. Right? This is a time for transparency. This is not a time to kind of choose our words carefully so as to, you know, make sure we don't offend anybody. We're going to offend people. We, we, we just have to give each other the benefit of the doubt and, and kind of understand um, that in a time of crisis, especially, most people have good intentions. It might not always be obvious to you that they do, but give them the benefit of the doubt and keep doing and saying things that draw people forward and that, that kind of acknowledge that 
uh, dissent and observations and all of that are, are gifts. You know, the, the, those are treasures. Those aren't annoyances. In routine operations, maybe you could call those annoyances. I wouldn't, but you could be forgiven. But in times of crisis, anything but. Well, Amy, thank you for that, because I think that really sets an extraordinary perspective and stage. And the, the bimodal aspect of it is, is I really had not thought of it that way before. And it, it it really does bring a whole new perspective on it. Now, with that as a backdrop, Noel, um, let me turn to you. You know, your work um, has ingrained in many of us uh, the need to stay grounded by the imperative to always focus on how to create value for the customer. With the dramatic disruption that we're all facing to whatever our normal was, what do you think are the most important things for us to keep in mind as we reset and chart a value-based path forward? Okay. Um, thank you, John. John, and once again, just, just as Amy is, I'm very pleased to be, uh, to be on, this, <coughs> on, on this panel. Uh, I want to, before I answer that question specifically, let, let me just step back for a little and consider where we are. Um, with COVID-19, you know, with its uh, uh, cases going up, uh, deaths headed towards 100,000, uh, uh, increased um, projections of, of bad stuff seem to be going, seem to be going up. Um, and, and what we're going through now is a, a gradual reopening uh, let's say of the of the of the economy, um, uh, but I think that the people that are uh, are making the decisions about the economy have sort of got it wrong. Uh, and let me let me explain, because this will lead into an answer to your to your question. Uh, uh, when people are talking about opening up the economy, whether I hear uh, you know, the governors or local officials or, or, or the news media, it seems to me that the sort of dominant perspective is that we've got to get the factories moving we've, uh, and producing stuff. We've got to get the supply chain working. Uh, we've got to get the stores open and then the people in, 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 in the stores. Uh, and if we do those things, let's call it a triumvirate, the factory, the supply chain, and, and the store for consumers, then we've sort of got it licked. And that's, that seems to be, to be the focus. What the problem is that that model um, uh, leaves out one rather crucial element, and that is customers. Uh, you know, Peter Drucker taught us many years ago that the purpose of business is to, to create a customer. Uh, and if we don't have customers, then regardless of what we do at the factory level, the supply chain and the store is sort of, is sort of irre irre irrelevant. Uh, so the question one's got to ask is if, in fact, the, the, the COVID-19 crisis is going to get worse, is getting worse, if the reopening is, uh, is, is uh, going to cause more, you know, more deaths, more people with the virus, where are the customers going to come from? Uh, are people going to come out of, their, out of their houses and, in fact, patronize uh, nice the stores? So I think that's a very real, I mean, it's maybe more of an issue, a direct issue for B2C, but ultimately it's an issue for, 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 for B2B. So I think a very serious question that uh, companies should be thinking about is, you know, who are their customers going to be as this reopening, reopening starts? And there are probably some seg segments that they've got to think about. There are some people who come out anyway. Uh, and others uh, will, you know, it, it will be the sort of the laggards, those that uh, want to stay stay home and keep away because they're very concerned about running into into COVID nineteen nine nine situations. So it, with that as background, I think for uh, as for for companies, all companies have some set of 
of skills, resources, uh, distinctive competence used to be the word Harvard used, uh, that, they, uh, that are fundamental to, the, to their business. Uh, and they have to look out at that environment, including the environment I just talked about, uh, and ident identify opportunities. I mean, where I like to use the PESTEL model, political, economic, uh, social, cultural, technological, uh, to legal, regulatory, and, and the, the physical environment to, met, to sort, of, sort of match at some level their distinctive competence and what's going on in the environment, and then look out for opportunity. And given with this tremendous disconnect, the opportunity may be in what they've been doing already uh, and their ability to deliver, to deliver value and get, and get customers, or it may be something completely different. You know, General Motors now is off making uh, re respirators, totally different, different business than that they've been in. So I think now is, is, is the time that companies should, of course, explore uh, what, they, what they've currently, what they've been doing, but also use this as an, as an opportunity you know, to scan a little more broadly and see if either they have the distinctive competence or can, can get the distinctive competence to address new opportunities and uh, bring value uh, to customers there. That, that, that is great, Noah, and it really does reinforce, I think, some of the things that we've been talking about in preparation uh, of we being the collective community that's pulled this this together um, regarding that focus on the customer and thinking about them first in terms of who they're going to be um, you know a lot of a lot of assumptions being made there about um, things just getting turned back on and somehow magically the same customer is going to be there and, and the, uh, uh, the the reinforcement of that just cannot be strong enough that we've really got to start to think about uh, how the, that customer is evolving, who's going to be different, is it the same base, is it a different base, et cetera. So we'll come back to that uh, momentarily. Um, let me turn now to Jeffrey, because that's a great lead in in terms of, you know, what are you seeing from the research that you're currently doing uh, and conducting uh, for your clients, with your clients, that could help us inform us uh, in, in during these initial stages of the reset uh, and, and as we move forward, are there some things that you would top line in terms of trends, things that you think uh, people might be uh, really able to, to take away at the, at the highest level as we start this conversation? Yeah, so we've, been, so we've done, I think, now 21,000 surveys starting in early March, and we've seen some changes to, to Noel's point about organizations trying to figure out the opportunities. Early on, there was a belief that we, we did some discount testing. You know, maybe if we discount by 10 or 20 or 30 percent, we can get people to come out who are reluctant to come out and found no level of discounting had any effect. Uh, you know, people's behavior had, was starting to change. Um, uh, we did some research uh, on the finance side with small businesses wh who were very quickly seeing an evaporation in demand. 63% uh, of the 500 small businesses we surveyed said that they needed government help immediately um, to be able to survive. And that survey was done near the uh, end, I think it was March 24th, March 25th. And already 2% of the businesses that we surveyed had gone out of business. Uh, many were closed, um, what they hoped was temporarily. Uh, so I think that what, what we saw there was one of the things that led to the urgency of PPP, uh, the, the payroll protection uh, plan and some of the SBA uh, initiatives. Um, early, early work was around, well, how do we message to our consumers to meet their concerns? And we've seen across the board, whether you're hospitality or real estate, um, concern about uh, the cleaning processes that you're using, disinf you, you know, if you're going to an open house, what are you doing? If you're going to a restaurant, if you're going to uh, a hotel, you know, what are the disinfection protocols that people are following now? How have those changed? Um, when when I first started, you, you, you mentioned with the, that I started as an industry analyst and we used to use something called the Gompertz technology curve, which was sort of this S curve of um, growth. Uh, and what we what we found in some categories is we've kind of folded the paper. All of a sudden, um, we're seeing a tremendous acceleration. Um, I, I mentioned to Simon I hadn't heard of Zoom, you know, uh, 
two months ago, and I think this is my ninth Zoom uh, since then. So um, we're seeing a tremendous change. We're seeing an uptick in you know online education uh, has become mainstream even at elementary school levels, um, and we're also seeing the acceleration on the other side. Industries that were in trouble and decline, such as retail, uh, really having to adapt very quickly. Um, one of the things that I've been encouraging all of our customers to do is to explore the pain points of their customers today. Where are they not um, meeting customers' needs given these changes? So for instance, in retail, um, many had experimented with curbside pickup or um, different uh, or you know delivery from a central warehouse. Um, but those systems had really are really being tested now and falling short in in, in many ways. So. Um, uh, I think early on it was, you know, discounting messaging. Now it's trying to really understand the reset. You know, what are the long-term implications for the industry? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a great, uh, I think, um, overview of, of, of what's really happening in the market in terms of, of and I think it, it correlates quite well with some of the other things that we're seeing in the council and some other discussions we're having with, a uh, variety of our members and partners and other relationships, uh, this, this dramatic um, look to how to move forward, but also, uh, as you said, where, where are the pain points? I, I don't think we can possibly uh, overemphasize that based on some things that we've seen uh, where some companies just were not ready with their technology to implement some of the changes that they've got to make in order to deal with the right user experience uh, as somebody's trying to order from them in a different uh, different world. So we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Simon, um, would you like to take it from yeah. this point in terms of some uh, questions? Uh, so, so Jeffrey, I just wanted to follow up on on the point we were talking about. We, we were talking actually in the preamble a little bit about some of the IBM research as well that, that seems to point to um, you know, there's a way of thinking about the types of changes that you're seeing and it gets into the sort of shape of recoveries. You know, we in a V shape uh, recovery kind of a model where you go, the research you're doing now basically is a window in time, but don't worry, everything is gonna come back to normal. Or is it, you know, the L shape or whatever that shape is? I think the key question, and maybe, you know, you can share some perspective, Jeffrey, on this is really, is the research pointing to more substantial long-term changes um, and how should companies really be thinking about um, what that means from a you know strategy messaging perspective because if these changes are really long term that's very different from a short blip yeah so a couple things there uh, simon uh, that ibm research uh, was interesting one of the points that I, I didn't mention is that of course it is changing attitudes uh, i would say that you would have seen in the us over the last five or ten years a move away from private car ownership just at the margins but uh, with people doing ride sharing and things and that ibm research uh, showed that you know people suddenly uh, want you know not that they can afford it now but they want to have their own car because they don't want because they feel like you know you look at New York, the subway became a vector for um, for the disease, and so people are, you know, reprioritizing having private uh, private transportation. Uh, we're doing a survey tomorrow, looking at car. Uh, uh, road trips versus what would have been flights uh, and so forth. So all of a sudden the car, you know, might enjoy a renaissance when this is, when this is over. We always caution our, our clients around asking people, asking consumers now to imagine, you know, what things are going to be like. Like, so for hospitality, it was like, if, if this hotel has been used to quarantine um, patients, you know, what would need to be done before you would feel comfortable staying in it. And um, that's enough far forward that, I, I, I caution them that, that that information was directional or qualitative. Um, and so I have been encouraging my clients to think about scenario planning, you know, and some of the scenarios are, are more positive, like, you know, a snapback in demand and we kind of forget this, uh, which some sociologists kind of believe happened in some level for the 1918-1919 uh, uh, epidemic, um, that it didn't have that lasting uh, uh, an imprint. Um, though even interestingly there, there's some signs that like train travel didn't resume to its normal levels um, for four or five years. But um, 
Hmm. I think you have to have scenarios about the V shape, the U shape and the L shape and what that means on your, on your industry, unfortunately, in terms of uh, how long this lasts. Um, there are scenarios where we get a vaccine quicker than we've ever had a vaccine. And then there are scenarios where no vaccine is ever, is ever found. Um, so um, it really requires a, a great organizational agility and flexibility while thinking about multiple possibilities and realizing that no one has a crystal ball and can pick which scenario is going to be the one that happens. So a Amy, if I can sort of turn to you now a little bit, it's go. given the rapidity through which these changes have actually occurred, you know, I assume in a normal circumstance, you would have time to talk to companies to say, you know, here's how you create a culture that's, that's a fearless culture. Uh, and here are the benefits from, from doing this. Obviously things have changed very rapidly. Two questions really would be, and the, I think one builds on the other is, um, what do companies need to be doing differently now, um, given that the window is now is very short for real change? Uh, and what are the benefits that you think companies can realize from making the types of changes that, that you talk about? Why is this so important right now? Well, the, I mean, the, the right now, answer is also bimodal because right now means uh, both i mean i think we we're, we've been thinking more in general many of us i'll just i'll speak myself but the things i've been reading the things that uh, i hear about are about the challenges of working from home and and we hear less about the challenges of, of working overtime in you know potentially um, unsafe facilities but so they're both it's really two very different challenges so let me start with the working from home the, the challenge of uh, making sure that your employees who are working from home feel psychologically safe to use their voices, you know, to, to further the, uh, the mission of the organization um, really is one of doing the things that I would recommend doing in normal times, but more explicitly, you know, more proactively. And, and that includes such things as um, recurring reminders of of why it matters um, the work we do it just sort of you know again it's the me to we getting people out of themselves and and back on purpose um, more specifically for working at home never start you know a video conference or a, a phone conference by assuming you know what's going on for that employee in the background right you don't so there has to be this pause there has to be this check-in uh, that has to be built into how we communicate with each other. Is this a good time? Um, how are you doing? Right? I mean, I think one of the one of the largest complaints many work from home employees are uh, expressing right now is that they're not when when they're not being asked how they're doing. And so that's a a, a, a crucial point. Um, one of the things that we're learning is that people um, are employees are more satisfied with their company's response and feel more listened to and feel more heard uh, when two things are true. One is there's frequent proactive communication. Like we just keep sharing, what do you know? What do you not know? What, what are we doing? What are we thinking? We don't, we don't have a clear line of sight on the future, but this is what we're thinking. And the other is they, um, they express that they believe there's a sort of safe channel for them to give feedback or speak up or express um, what their needs are. You know, and when, when those two things are present, um, you're much better off in terms of having the right kind of culture to withstand the current assault. Now, relatedly, if you're at work, if you're working in a hospital, if you're working in a, in a warehouse um, or any other essential uh, workplace facility, um, the chances are that you not only have the old challenges that you um, used to want and need to speak up about, but some new ones as well. And so um, everyone from CEOs to frontline supervisors need to be going out of their way to kind of um, express interest, curiosity, and compassion for what people are up against. And, and just, you know, it's a, there's a kind of a stance of, I'm interested and how can I help? Right. That is the that is the leadership stance that will help create the 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 environment that's so necessary right now. You might be muted, Simon. 
Okay, no, if I can turn to you. <laughs> so normally, you know, I, I think there's kind of a process if you're a, a company, your goal is to deliver the value that clients are looking for. Um, and probably that's a process of seeking it out. Um, in a crisis like this, I'm assuming that actually what you thought was your value proposition is actually changing, uh, sort of changing as we speak. And so actually you're trying to find the greatest value proposition of your company at a time when, when, when what that might be is moving. How do companies think about, uh, how should they be thinking about that um, in terms of a path to, to creating the greatest value at a time of change? Oh, I think probably they hired Jeffrey. Uh, <laughs> um, it's it's you know typically in 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 the world we were used to up until a few few months ago. You know, typically companies' requirements change over time. So, in, in a B two B sense, for for example, you have an account manager who's working with with client client executives and trying to dig in and understand what those uh, requirements are, feed those back into the organization, and then there are a set of, of changes, change, changes is, uh, uh, take place. What we have now, of course, as, as I talked about just, just a while ago, is this tremendous change then in terms of who, uh, of, of uh, loss of, of, of customers. Um, that, that there needs to be some very good research on finding out what the what the new issues issues are. I mean, let me give you just just one one example, uh, for example, um, which is is front and center in terms of the so called re reopening, uh, and that that concerns a restaurant. So in a number of states, we're starting to see restaurants restaurants open. Um, and one of the things that the, the restaurants are starting to do, certainly in places like Georgia, are, are doing the sort of positive things one would expect. So they are, uh, the menus are going to be disposable. They're setting the tables. You know, a number of the reg regular tables would, be, have, uh, would not be able to be sat on. So you retain social distancing and so forth. And that's, that, that's fine. So the idea there is that what that restaurant is giving is trying to give to potential customers the sense that we understand this virus, we, we're going to do the, the, all the mitigation steps that we can possibly do to attract customers, customers in. That's absolutely fine, but they've forgotten one thing. Now, Irving Goffman, the famous psychologist years ago, talked about, or sociologist, I guess, talked about on stage and off stage. They're the on stage uh, uh, things that the customer sees. So that's the ones they've just talked about. But then they're the off stage things. You know, what's going on in the kitchen? Are the people in the kitchen washing their hands? Are they wearing masks? Are they doing that sort of thing? Mostly individual consumers uh, pre-COVID-19 didn't really worry about that much. The assumption was that everything was, at, was fine. But now with COVID-19, I think that's an issue which is going to concern many potential restaurant goers. Okay, so the front, the onstage stuff is fine, looks great. But what really is going on offstage? So I think there, for example, is a new need, if you like, that has become raised. And the, for the issue for the restaurant is to, how am I going to do, do that? You know, how, how can I convince my customers, not just that the on stage is fine, but also off stage is fine. So I think the, the, the basic answer to your question is, we've got to look for, in this new world, there will be other needs and so forth uh, will come to the surface, may be developed. The firm has to be on top of those. They've got to be very, very clear about them. And then they've got to, got to, got to, to respond to them. No, no, just, uh, oh, go ahead, Amy. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Sorry, if I could just, uh, just add one very oh, quick thing. And, and, the, and the question would actually be, so in the idea of on stage and off stage, 
you know, uh, how broad are those dimensions? So, for example, as we're looking at um, buying from Amazon or a financial services firm is thinking about what it's doing, is offstage how much maybe the CEO is getting paid, whether or not, you know, the employees are being treated right. Is, is that sort of one way for us to be thinking about this idea? Well, I think you could think about it, about it that way. That's not normally the way it's, it's considered. Normally the way it's considered, I mean, a restaurant example is a, is, is a nice one. And in the, uh, the pre-COVID-19 world, understanding that what some restaurants do is actually put the off stage on stage. Right there, there are uh, you know you go to a sushi restaurant, the sushi bar is there, so you can see exactly what 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 what's going on. But I think if you're you're now talking something more broadly about uh, about how how customers feel about the company they're dealing with, so it's not just about the product or service they're thinking of of purchasing. It's a broader sense of what sort of organization. Uh, this is, and I think you. Uh, so I wouldn't call that off, off stage, but it is a sort of off stage sort of thing. But I think on a somewhat different dimension, but a very important one. The, the restaurant the, uh, example. If, uh, so one of the things I've encouraged clients to do is uh, there's a great William Gibson quote: "The future is here; it's just not distributed evenly." And um, Asia and the Pacific countries are further along in terms of what they've experienced. And so to that end, uh, I think it was a week ago, I actually stayed up till like 1 a.m. and attended an APAC webinar uh, because I wanted to hear what they were talking about. And so, you know, on restaurants, uh, you know, in Wuhan, uh, there was restaurant chain which opened up, but no one came, you know, no one's coming. Uh, there was a restaurant in Bangkok where uh, they've basically put sort of transparent screens around each sure table so that people can sit there. Uh, and so one other place organizations can look for ideas is to um, Asia PAC, uh, which is dealing with, which is further along in terms of uh, reopening and, and uh, how their, 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 their countries are reacting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, along those lines, the, 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 the front stage and backstage really brings up a couple of thoughts and questions in my mind. One is, um, first of all, I think about Disney immediately because we've done a lot of work with Disney over the years and they certainly use that terminology in terms of their theme parks and their staff, what's front stage, what's backstage. Uh, the, the Disney cast members, as they're called, are all of the people that are out front uh, versus everything going on in the back. But it, but it also goes well beyond restaurants, right, to what's going on front and back. And that makes me think about, in some ways, the opportunities that are there for companies and brands who have a backstage process that's got more capability in it than than's ever been tapped by the front stage. And an example of that would be, think about how we all thought about WB Mason perhaps as an office supply entity in the past and how with them, without them even trying to directly reach the consumer because they have the supply chain for things that consumers need, paper towels, toilet tissue, uh, all kinds of things that, that might not otherwise have been purchased through them in the past by a consumer. All of a sudden, now they're a big consumer brand and they weren't even planning on it. So I'm just curious about, as all of you think about the opportunities that might be there for on the supply chain side, um, as people start as a B2B, then they wind up in B2C or vice versa, um, how do you think that might play out in, in some positive ways for folks and in, in, in brands in this case? And in, in terms of providing value to consumers, not necessarily because it's great for the brand, but because it really is new places that consumers can go. No, no, so let me t t take that one first of all. So I, th I think one thing that you understand is that whenever there's something, a severe negative and negative impact for organizations, there's always the flip side of that. It's positive for, 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 for some. And so just, uh, for, just to pick on, that, on that, that example, what is negative for retails, for the traditional retail store or the tradi traditional restaurant of people 
the A being unable to go into them because they're closed, or even when they reopen, being concerned to go, go to go into them is a real negative. It's a real positive for for people who are working online. So you, you've seen Amazon is now the most valuable brand in the world, uh, and Amazon's business has, has skyrocketed. So of many many companies who were, were historically just shipping stuff stuff because the perception is that when that package arrives at your door, there's no COVID nineteen on it. Versus if I go to the store, you know there there, there, there might be. So when I talked earlier on about opera opportunity. Uh, there is opportunity out there, and that that may mean changing the way you're doing business. So your your example just now, a company that was entirely B two B, found is that it, it it suddenly had distinctive competence uh, capability uh, for which uh, there was a customer need where they'd never even thought about it before, uh, which goes goes sort of goes back to uh, to Amy's point. With, with respect to, to ideas that, that you need as an organization to create an idea, uh, uh, a culture uh, where people can have ideas. And the one thing you do not do is say to somebody, you've got a crazy idea, get all the ideas out of there. If you tell people their ideas are crazy, you won't get them anymore. <laughs> That's right. Because, because it's, it's an attack on the person, attack on the personality. Uh, so uh, the idea of developing a culture that is very open, that uh, that uh, requests consumers, uh, employees to come for their ideas, has a system for sorting them out and so forth, uh, is absolutely essential. So I'm, I'm fully, absolutely, fully in agreement with everything Amy, Amy said at the beginning there. And Amy, it's it always, does, go ahead, go ahead, please. No, I was just going to say, it, it does represent, I mean, what Noel is talking about represents a fundamental shift from, you know, what I would call management thinking to innovation thinking or design thinking, that, that it sort of starts with where are the needs, where are the opportunities, um, and starts generating possibilities and testing and, and picking and sorting and, um, and refining uh, to get to new solutions, right? New solutions that add value in new ways. I mean, it's really fundamentally about um, opportunities to create value. Um, that all sounds good, uh, and it is good, um, and it comes with um, sort of an enormous pain along the way. And some of that pain is psychological. I mean, the folks who've been sort of thinking KPIs and lines of sight and deliverables and targets and so forth, they're going to have to learn a new way of thinking, full stop. Um, but it's also pain as, you know, as Amazon gains more market share, uh, someone else is losing it. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the losses are coming in um, from companies with higher um, labor concentration, right? There's, there's more employees in retail stores um, than in, um, in, in per object sold than in, in Amazon warehouses. So um, if there's, there's going to, you know, when all is said and done, whether it's a V, a U, a W, something else, L, we're going to have fewer people um, employed. And, and that's a kind of broader challenge that um, we have to be thinking about. You know, and picking up on that point, Amy, uh, we, and we do have some questions coming in from the audience, and I'd encourage, you know, anyone out there to, to by all means, uh, sub submit those and we'll, we'll address as many as we can in, in the time available. But um, uh, one that in particularly, I think, ties to this notion of, all right, we, there are going to be people with employment difficulties, but the other challenge is uh, at some point, people will be going back to the office or some people are going back to the office. And the question revolves around how do we bring people back in in a safe way and how's that handled. But as, as I think about it, I also add to that the connection of, and the way, the way companies handle that and how they treat their employees, how they accept now more remote working mm -hmm. becomes mm -hmm. part of their culture, but also becomes part of their brand essence. And is that going to also spill over into how their customers then feel about them, the way they're treating their their teams and their employees. It always seems to interconnect, but I would think it'd be so much more visible and transparent today. Any thoughts on that? 
I mean, some customers pay more attention to those things than others. Um, and yet I, I think ultimately your brand as an employer does matter a great deal. Now, more concretely, how will people move, you know, how, how do we make it safe and, um, and kind of tailored, if you will, in, in, the, in the returning to the office so that people feel good about it and feel excited about it? I mean, there's certainly, um, we've lo we, we lose a lot when we don't get to see our colleagues. I mean, there's something um, uh, joyful or at least interesting about coming and, and, and seeing our, you know, our, our work friends um, each day. But I, I think the most important thing is, um, is going to be to tailor it to the different needs of different people. And that's going to take effort on the part of HR and, um, and, and immediate supervisors and managers to kind of make sure they understand what people are up against um, at home or in terms of their own personal um, uh, feelings of, of safety about uh, rejoining uh, proximal work. Um, I also think there's going to be a residual, I hope, this is the hope, I hope that there's a residual from this extended period of time where everybody was working for home, I mean from home, if, you know, in, in workplaces where that's the case, uh, to begin to sort of think, now wait a minute, you know, what part of our work really does benefit from proximity and what doesn't? You know, if you're writing up a report, um, sometimes the very best thing you can have is a, you know, a closed door at home and no, you know, nobody bothering you and just focus on that writing. If you're brainstorming uh, a new idea or a way to uh, solve a problem that's persistent in the supply chain, um, there's no question that the sort of the proximity, the whiteboards, the interrupting each other and bouncing off each other is actually you know, valuable and necessary to that activity. So maybe we will be thinking more uh, deeply and carefully about what kinds of things benefit from being together and what kind of things benefit from not being together. You know, under what conditions does it make sense to cut off the commute time, you know, give people that time back to be productive? And under what, uh, can what for what tasks and under what conditions um, do. No, we really, we both need and want to be together for those. And it seems that we, because we need to, if anything, double down and triple down in parallel process and solve not only as, you know, coming back to the theme here of the reset, right, that everybody has to do in terms of reevaluating their strategy, adapting it, right. Translating that into their business strategy or, or their nonprofit strategies in the fundraising world, uh, and then translating that into marketing and communications, and how does that all tie together? Um, every minute is going to count, and 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 know, it won't be one size fits all, right? Yeah. It will not be. You know, it's going to have to be a very mi tailored micro approach. Right. John, you may if I have a question for Amy, uh, and it's a bit of an elephant in the room, I, I think. Uh, do you have any concern uh, with so many people working at home that people are actually working? <laughs> or they're, or they're, wor they're supposed yeah. to be working 100% for you and yeah. they're actually got two jobs? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, think, that? <laughs> I think if you as an employer can't tell the difference um, between um, people working and not working, then you've got another problem, right? So in other words, um, this isn't the industrial era where I can tell how much you're working by seeing you, you know, showing your face in the office. Ah, you know, Noel's here for 10 hours, therefore Noel's working hard. If there is no other way uh, to assess your, your value add um, than how many hours you put in, I've got a problem. Right. So the reality is I, we need to um, understand the quality of your thinking and, and uh, you know, the quality of your teaming with your colleagues uh, that and what's coming out of that um, to really understand whether whether um, we're excited about having you on the team. Can I can I just build actually, John, on just a, a couple of the points that Noel and Amy have mentioned? I think one of the things that resonates for me is this the idea of no, not one size fits all. You know, I certainly think that as we look at who's being successful and who's not being successful, to some extent, it's probably has maybe less to do with the company and maybe the industry or the sector that you happen to be in. It's like one of those things where 
all of a sudden the world changed. Uh, and that's great for Amazon, terrible for retail. It's not like you were in retail. What were you thinking? So that figuring out, understanding that in the broader context, I think to some extent is probably useful for people to know, but it doesn't mean to say that they can't make the changes, right? At the end of the day, and here's the question with this, uh, since there's so much, there's so little in a way time, there's so much pressure of the crisis to get things done, people have got to prioritize. So if you're a winner or you're sort of in that loser category or somewhere in between, from each of your perspectives, are there very specific, you know, recommendations that you would tell people, so this is what you really need to be doing now, you know, one or two or three things to go, this is the most important thing, these should be the priorities. And if you do this, it'll give you the greatest chance of, uh, you know, hitting the ground running when through the crisis or at least surviving the crisis. Well, uh, okay, let me just, just say quickly, uh, quickly, I think one of the things this crisis is, is maybe done is to speed up a set of things that were happening, happening anyway. Uh, I, I think it's pretty clear for anyone who's really looked at the retail industry, uh, the retail industry has had a lot of, lot, lot of trouble. We've seen you know, a, a lot of close downs, uh, both of, of, uh, of small retail, but also of chains. I remember we had Radio Shack. Uh, we've seen what's been happening this year over, over, over the years. So I think that in, in some ways, uh, and I, I feel very strongly for small stores, uh, which uh, Amy is quite right. In, the, the employment level in retail is extremely high in the United States. Uh, they were all, all already um, feeling trouble. Now, I know what's happening in some areas is that uh, storefront stores have stopped selling physical goods and have moved to services because you can't buy a, a meal or you can't go to the gym on Amazon, right? You have to physically physically be there. Uh, so I, I, I think that uh, one, one, one thing that anyone in that business or in any business has got to be concerned about is that maybe the, uh, the maybe things are not going to go back the way they were. The, what, the, what, there's been an acceleration of some trends that were going to happen, but which really speaks then to the issue we, uh, where John started me off with was, you know, what are the opportunities? Uh, and let me look for opportunities. May maybe even though I'm in bad shape now, if things start to get better, I'm, that's going to be, I'm going to be okay. Uh, and therefore I've got to start plans for reopening and that sort of thing. But maybe this is a wake up call. It's not going to go be the same. I've got to start looking for other options. Yeah, so I could pick up on that, um, Simon, because I think it's, um, I think Noel's absolutely right. I think one thing that's absolutely clear, there's not going to be a return uh, for anybody. I mean, maybe maybe makers of, of um, sanitizing materials will, will go back to a sort of more usual um, volumes, but uh, but it's not going to be a return. There's no back uh, to go to. It's only going to be a forward a, a uh, you know, what do, we, what do we create from here and how do we do it? Really messy, unclear stuff. Um, so I think the most important thing that um, companies can do is name it, right? Is to get out there, get out ahead of it. Say what you know, say what you don't know. Um, try stuff, you know, act uh, to learn quickly about what works and then engage in uh, much more communication than you think is strictly necessary. Um, double it, triple it, and and keep updating. I mean, people are really hungry. Even if you don't have really brand new news, update anyway. Let people know what's happening, what you're thinking, and resist the human urge um, to be defensive, um, you know, and to, to say, oh, no, 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 we did the right thing. Chances are you're doing 10 wrong things every day. That's okay. Um, none of us have ever been here before. Jeffrey? I think too, too often when people think about experimenting, they look at the failures as bad and as something to be avoided. And I think, you know, I've always been impressed by organizations that embrace failure, 
use that to learn from uh, and test. And I think if an organization isn't, doesn't have that level of failure, it's not gonna be able to adapt. You have to, especially right now, you have to be trying many different things and many of those aren't gonna resonate, but you at least need to put the effort in and see if they will, will, will resonate um, and be much more, much more tolerant of um, negative outcomes than, than a lot of organizations are. Well, as we're approaching the, uh, the, the uh, top of the hour here, uh, I think this is a conversation that could go on for quite some time. And as we stated earlier, um, to kind of wrap things up, uh, the, uh, the reset is really an opportunity for leaders and their teams. And I think that's what we're hearing quite a bit of here in internal and external to really engage at all levels and really directly connect uh, strategy and marketing communications and maximize that value. And they're going to have to do that by doing a lot of parallel processing uh, and really breaking down the barriers that many barriers that were there before that need to, to come down uh, immediately if they're going to be able to, to move forward successfully. And I, I just can't thank our panelists enough for helping us to uh, really get some critical foundation in place here as to how to think about addressing some of that opportunity and think about it. So on behalf of Simon and me, our supporting partners and everyone in our audience today, uh, I wanna thank our panelists for sharing their valuable time. As you can imagine, they're very much in demand. Uh, their perspective, their insights and their guidance with us at this really critical uh, reset point in our journeys. And I also wanna remind everybody here to please mark your calendars for the next session of this series, which is going to be on Wednesday, May, uh, May 20th at 12 noon uh, Eastern time. And that's the COVID-19 reset strategy, marketing and communications in a new world in which we're going to explore uh, the reset directly from the perspective of some operating industry executives and what they are actually doing uh, to execute a, execute a value-based reset. Uh, that panel will include a very, really truly global uh, CMO in every definition of the world, Arun Sina. Uh, he's currently with Venstrada, previously was with uh, MSCI, JP Morgan, uh, Zurich Financial, and Pitney Bowes. He's been on the boards of Guthy Ranker. Uh, he was on my board, the Direct Marketing Association, where he was a member of the Executive Committee, and he's also currently a, a lecturer and senior faculty fellow at the Yale School of Management. Um, the registration details for that uh, will be sent to uh, all of the participants of today's webinar, but they're also posted on the council's website and on our, will be on our LinkedIn page shortly. Uh, so we hope that you can continue to join us uh, as this complimentary series uh, continues and progresses. Uh, thanks to all of the audience for joining us today. And again, special thanks to our supporting partners and a very extra special thank you uh, to these very distinguished and special uh, panelists that have, have taken the time to join us today. Uh, until our next session, in the meantime, we hope that each of you, your families, your friends, uh, and business teams stay safe and stay well. Thank you very much.